We often think a cyber attack is this super stealthy event where attackers are able to get away without having anything attributed to them. And this is in part due to Hollywood's portrayal of hacking and a general lack of understanding amongst the public on how cyber attacks actually work. While it can be true that attackers can take actions to cover their steps, it's not always what happens. In fact, you notice a disparity between the more sophisticated hackers that do cover their tracks and the, really the wider breadth of other hackers hackers that don't necessarily cover their tracks, and that leaves what are called IOCs, or Indicators of Compromise. IOCs are bits of information that detail basically what the attacker did on the target network or system that defenders and forensics analysts can use to basically figure out not only who did the attack, but what they did over the course of the attack. And these IOCs can be anything from a hash to an entire tool. Now again, the more sophisticated attackers will be sure to cover their tracks, they'll go back through and delete everything that they loaded onto the system. Maybe they created an account that they need to get rid of. They'll try to do those things to cover their tracks and prevent the defense from identifying anything that they did. However, again, by and large, a lot of threat actors fail to do this. And this leaves a set of crumbs that defenders can dig through and identify who ultimately did the attack. That said, it does not take long at all for a lot of IOCs to be collected. And so that presents a new challenge. How is it that you can analyze all these IOCs that you've corrected, really put them in the proper context without really making a hash value your proof that a specific threat group is responsible for a cyber attack, aka what is the value of each IOC that you collect? Well, let's talk about the pyramid of pain and how it helps us do exactly that, how it helps us rank each IOC that we collect and identify what really what def defenses can do to make offense much more difficult. This not only helps us understand the IOCs that we're collecting, but it also helps us understand the different actions that we can take to really disrupt cyber attacks either before they happen or even as they're happening. We'll also find out how the pyramid of pain tells us to hit the like button. Hit the like button. Okay, so what is the pyramid of pain? This is a concept developed in 2014 by David Bianco. And I've included a link to his article down in the video description if you want to continue to read more on the pyramid of pain. Basically, this graphically ranks the different IOCs that you'll encounter in the wild, from least valuable to most valuable. And they also overlay that with how much pain it causes attackers whenever you collect these IOCs and perform different actions with those IOCs. Again, from the bottom being trivial impact to the top being large impact on attackers. And we're gonna talk more about that at every level. The pyramid of pain can Consists of six different layers. Hash values, IP addresses, domain names, network, host artifacts, tools, and TTPs, or tactics, techniques, and procedures. So let's start from the bottom and work our way up to the top. Hash values. These can be trivial whenever you encounter them. However, as David notes, they it might seem counterintuitive that they are ranked this low in the pyramid of pain. After all, what's the probability that you're gonna find two completely different files that have the same hash? Well, that's called a collision. Probably pretty low. So wouldn't that make each hash value pretty high confidence if it does turn up to be malicious? Well, that might be true. However, the entire hash value changes whenever just one byte in the entire file is altered. So that can be anything from literally changing the case of one character in a comment uh, in the file to functionally leaving the entire file the exact same and stripping out all the comments. These can produce different hash values, which means that you might have one hash value that hits as malicious, but you might have a whole host of hash values that don't hit as malicious, that may in fact be of the exact same file functionally. This means that while having a hash value can in fact be handy and being able to identify a malicious hash is definitely good, it's not necessarily proof in and of itself that something bad's going on and that something not bad is going on. So don't disregard hashes, but you're going to need some more evidence. IP addresses. If you have any kind of network connection, there are going to be IP addresses, whether those are internal private IP addresses or they are connecting to an external IP address. So for an attacker to initiate an attack, they're going to have to make a network connection. And for that to happen, they're going to have to expose an IP address to your network. That IP address can be anything from a proxy server to a command and control server or a malware dropper. And finding an IP address that we either know is malicious or we don't recognize and is suspicious, that can give us some confidence that something fishy may be afoot. Afoot. That said, they are also this low on the pyramid of pain because VPNs exist. Anybody can change the last IP address that hits the target network in 
and it's pretty trivial. Either they can do this with Tor, they can do this with a commercial VPN, or they could even do this with a previously compromised IP address that they own. So kind of like hashes, an IP address isn't necessarily proof in and of itself that something bad is happening, but it certainly is good information to hold on to and collect and use later in your investigation. Just bear in mind that if the attacker is anything other than a script kitty or worse, that probably is not their IP address, like their true IP address. Domain names. To disguise their external infrastructure, which could include, again, malware droppers or command and control servers or C2s, attackers may attempt to disguise a system with a domain name, and this can come in a number of forms. They could either deliberately try to knock off a commonly known domain, like let's say Facebook. They may try to knock off Facebook's domain name by changing the O's to zeros, or they may try to do other kinds of common misspellings like that, really in an effort to trick users to visiting that C2 and maybe having malware drop on their machine, or in an attempt to bypass filtering. Sometimes they'll have previously compromised a legitimate domain and might be hosting their C2 or other infrastructure in a subdomain on a legitimate web host. So what might look like legitimate traffic to a small business may in fact be malicious traffic that small business doesn't really realize that their host has been compromised. These are a bit more challenging for attackers to change than just an IP address because again with an IP address you just change the VPN network you're on but with this you're going to have to re-register with the DNS cache you're going to have to maybe spend some money to get a domain name registered and that can take some time and can be a little annoying. That said, it's absolutely possible for attackers to do this even for free. So it is really kind of medium low on this pyramid. Network and host artifacts. This is where David shows that we're finally able to start annoying the hackers. I'm also gonna borrow the example that he used in his blog because frankly, I couldn't come up with a better one. This one made a lot of sense for me, so it'll probably make a lot of sense for you as well. Say a user is attempting to enumerate subdomains within a web host that you're hosting. And you, during that enumeration, you notice that they are using a very specific user agent. Like let's say the attacker is using Firefox on an Ubuntu host. If you're able to block web requests from that specific user agent, then you're going to force the attacker to have to find a different user agent. Again, it's not hard to do that, but they're gonna have to identify how exactly you detected their user agent and how exactly they can hide from getting detected again. So again, even while it's trivial, we're really just annoying the attackers at this level of the pyramid. Tools. This is where we're actually able to cause some pain to the attacker. In fact, at this level, it really starts to get to be challenging for attackers to make changes. At this level, say that you've managed to detect the attacker using a specific tool. You can actually deny the execution of that tool to them, and that's going to force them to have to find a new tool that, they're, that they can use that has a similar function. For example, let's say that the attacker is trying to use like LinPs, which is a Linux enumeration tool. In this scenario, you've managed to identify something within LinPs that is unique to LinPs and that allows you to block execution of LinPs in your network. The attacker will not be able to detonate LinPs and enumerate inside of your Linux environment, so they're going to have to basically find another sort of enumeration tool, learn how to use it and use it properly, and then get it back onto the target system. That can be not only very annoying, but it can actually be pretty challenging, especially when you've denied a number of tools to them. They're gonna have to identify other tools that perform similar function and train on them, so that way they can be really strong enough on those tools that they're not gonna get caught. But of course, by now, they already realize that they're causing some noise. So you can carry this logic over to any other tool that they're using, and the more tools that you can block, the more common hacking tools that you can block, then the more pain that you are going to be causing attackers. That's really where, why this is really towards the top of the pyramid of pain because it can be a real challenge, not only with just time and effort, but also with the time spent looking for the tool and, and trying to find a tool that performs a similar function. A lot of times attackers will reuse the same tools throughout attacks because they're comfortable with it and they know what the tool can do. So forcing them to go away from their areas of strength and confidence and really seek out tools that they're not so confident in, you might cause them to make additional mistakes. All the while, time is being lost. Tactics, techniques,
techniques and procedures. We are now at the top of the pyramid of pain. And of course, this is where you can cause the most pain to attackers. So in the last level of the pyramid, we talked about changing what the attackers use. But at this level, we change how attackers use tools. We're changing how the attackers perform their attack. Say for instance, you know that at some point in an attack, the attacker will perform Kerber roasting. If you can set up enough alerts and detections around things that happen whenever Kerber roasting happens on your network, then you can actually catch attackers trying to do that and in fact deny them the ability to rely on that attack technique. This has a bit of a more pronounced effect than the last level because again, it's not like they can just search for a similar tool and just deploy the new tool. They're going to have to search for an entirely new strategy on how to hack at your system. They're going to have to learn and practice with that. It's again, we, we talked about in the last level that attackers will reuse tools because they're comfortable with it. They'll also reuse techniques and procedures and tactics because they know what they're good at. They know their strengths and they know what to do in certain situations if the opportunity is presented to them. But if you deny them their strengths and you force them to really rely on TTPs and tools that they're not as strong on, again, you're causing them to make more noise. You're causing them to have to spend time to learn new things and you're really taking them out of their comfort zone and that will either cause them to either abandon their attack or just get caught. So if you've implemented this top level of the pyramid as well as all the other levels of the pyramid and you've identified these things, you've put detections around these things and you've managed to implement defenses and identify when different things are going on on your network, then you are going to be able to cause a lot of pain for attackers throughout the entire course of their attack. Now understand that it is very hard for organizations to fully implement this pyramid. After all, again, the pain ranking goes both ways. The higher you go up the pyramid, the more tooling and alerting and the more staff you might need to be able to really fully get that. And for an organization, that can also cause some pain. So it can be a bit of a double-edged sword. And while many organizations fail at this, it is so critically important to get it right. Because again, if you can deny attackers their strengths, then you are actually putting your organization at a very strong position in terms of security. You'll never get hit perfect, but you can definitely hit strong. That's it. You can stop a lot of these attacks at the very beginning by creating a strong human firewall, and that requires a lot of training. And a lot of the things that people fail at is phishing. So watch this video and see if it might be a resource for your organization for employees to learn more about how to identify phishing emails. Also, be sure to hit that like button so this video can hit new audiences and subscribe for more videos like this. All that, I'll see you all next time. Bye.